Welcome back, everyone. It's just such a pleasure to have you. Um, if you're just joining us, my name is Jay Metzger. I'm the acting president of the Nerissa Board of Directors. Uh, today with me, I have Faye Gore from National Geographic and Brandy Leroy, who came with Faye. And Brandy is a teacher from Maine. And so what I'd like to do is give them a chance to introduce themselves. As I mentioned, they have information on the special guest page. But we'll take a minute and let them introduce themselves. And then we'll go into another clip from the conversation with Jack where Jack talks about National Geographic education and some things that are on his mind. And uh, so let's go into Faye. Hi, welcome Faye, good to see you again. Hi, thank you Jay, uh, so happy to be here. Um, as Jay said, I work for National Geographic on the education team. Um, I actually support states in the Mid-Atlantic, but I'm also supporting uh, educators in the Northeast. And primarily my role is to bring all of our free resources to educators and youth. Um, in the states that I support, but also building partnerships like the one that we have with Esri that we'll probably talk about a little bit during um, this discussion. Um, and I'm super excited to have one of our National Geographic certified educators with us, um, not because she's just super fantastic, um, but also because one of, uh, and you can read all of my bio information, as they said, um, on the website, but what I'm most proud of is being an educator, being a teacher. I was a former classroom teacher and actually sure. taught in the high school that I graduated from. That and so I, graduated. I know the challenges that educators face. Um, I know um, the resource, the lack of resources sometimes that they have and the lack of support. You know, what I'm also super excited about is the fact that Narissa has leaned into education and they have a cool initiative, Adopt a Teacher, that I'm sure they're gonna talk about more in, in depth, um, that really aligns with our mission. And hopefully we'll get to talk about um, what National Geographic is trying to do in this space. So thank you for having us. Thanks, Faye. And Brandy, why don't you follow up and let us know a little more about yourself. And you know, I guess a little bit about why um, you chose to go, like, your relationship with National Geographic and how, I, you know, I guess eventually we'll get into, I'd love to hear about, how this this came up and how you get to meet Faye. But how about a little bit about yourself? Welcome. All right. Um, I am a social studies teacher at Bangor High School. I've been teaching for 14 years. Um, I really got into GIS um, probably I get five or six years ago. I'd had the worst year teaching geography. I hated it. I was miserable. Um, and my best friend was a GIS specialist for a town that was close to us. And she's like, let me come into your classroom for a day and we'll do some GIS stuff and I'll show the kids best day of the year. So I was like, okay, I need to learn more about this GIS stuff. So the main geographic Alliance, they had a professional development that summer. I went to it, fell in love with the technology. I went to, um, Esri the next year for T3G, um, where I fell even more in love with it um, and just started bringing it back to my kids as well as other educators. Um, and then through the Maine Geographic Alliance, they connected me with the National Geographic Educator Certification Program. Um, and I really got into that, um, loved it. Um, the former Northeast rep, Anastasia Cronin, she came up to Machias and was doing a professional development reach out to me. So I got even more involved with Nat Geo at that point. Um, and I actually got to go and present with on GIS at their education summit last year. So um, it's been a great experience um, being with both Esri and National Geographic. That is amazing. Thanks, Brandy. I really appreciate that. We're really so happy to have you here. And again, Brandy, the big thing here is, you know, as GIS professionals, We've been trying to put our own mindset into thinking how, you know, what can we do to help? And I think sometimes it's a little bit presumptive to think that we're going to know what to do to help. I mean, you know, I think you can have all the best intentions in the world and energy, but that's why we really want to hear from you and your colleagues and other teachers here because you're really the ones in the front line. And so I'm so excited to get back into this conversation. So why don't we take a quick, uh, brief break from discussion? Let's go into the, the conversation with Jack. It is an eight minute long video, so it's gonna take a minute. But honestly, the things that Jack gets into, I think are really interesting. And again, how many times do you have a chance to be a fly on the wall 
with uh, Jack Dangerman discussing education in National Geographic. So um, with that being said, we'll play the video and then we'll come back and discuss things afterwards. Um, what we're working on with National Geographic, which you referenced, is trying to get the curriculum builders in K through 12 to build curriculum on top of uh, GISs. So kids today learn GISs in high schools uh, all across the world, and uh, they really are, uh, they're learning GIS. But what National Geographic has in mind is that they learn geography uh, using GIS as a sort of an, almost an invisible platform. Um, well, this is, this is more than simply learning GIS or simply learning other curriculum. It's a whole spectrum from really high school kids, instead of taking woodshop or playing basketball or learning sports, they're learning GIS, project-based learning, to the idea that uh, GIS is enabling spatial learning in things like history or in uh, biology or in uh, social sciences of all types. So that's a spectrum. So when we say we want to get GIS into into uh, a new generation of kids, some of them are going to be problem solvers, just like GIS professionals are, and they'll grow up and really take meaningful. Other ones will just become more spatially literate. And our big hope is that the combination of these things create a new generation. Uh, National Geographic is calling it Gen Geo, uh, <laughs> and the generation of geographically literate kids who who play with and understand geography and its implications. They act better. They are better citizens. They're better uh, environmental, uh, environmentally conscious people. They're better engineers. They're better planners. They're better thinkers. They're better uh, consumers because they understand uh, all of the science uh, of geography and GIS in its digital form. So one of the big challenges for me is encouraging this connection between GIS professionals and educators. Uh, so that educators are taught, uh, they're made to realize the excitement that all of us share about GIS. You know, the lights go on for these teachers, and they will turn the lights on. Uh, actually, they have to sort of step aside in many ways, and the kids are just going to go after this like crazy. That's my real experience. You know, in the old days, uh, a lot of the members of ERISA were teachers, professors at MIT, Joe Ferreira, uh, for example, or um, Alan Schmidt or others, uh, th there was a large percentage of ERISA members that were in university. And uh, there was an attempt in early time periods to get teachers to, uh, in the K through 12 environments also to be ERISA members. So you made an interesting uh, statement. Uh, you said them over there versus us in here. <laughs> but if ERISA began to think about holistically, uh, teachers are the magical people and you brought them into into your organization and got them as excited and introduced to the world that you live in uh, this would be very cool Context. another dimension is emerging which is looking outward to kids and we've known for decades that that kids are attracted to gis technology and there's been lots of experiments from get the lead out in Detroit to uh, the Roosevelt High School in Los Angeles to uh, schools in Virginia, experimental work going on. But it's always been uh, a labor of love. The ERISA members being geo mentors with the teacher and trying to get them engaged and, and doing something. Uh, but I think that's now uh, matured to a level where the big players in education are beginning to realize GIS as a platform is actually uh, something. <laughs> it's actually something that we should we should share with kids. Uh, so if we look at a societal level, uh, what's going on? I think we need we need kids to to get engaged. When you talk to a young child, they're they're thrilled about the idea that they could actually participate in something like uh, science or technology, but they don't know exactly how. So we traditionally have taught them things, but they, they've not been engaged like project-based learning that is now becoming a possibility with GIS uh, in, the, in the web and in the cloud. ESRI has built a new relationship with National Geographic, and the relationship is all about building curriculum 
on top of a GIS so that it can uh, magically be integrated into all sorts of the social science disciplines and physical sciences as well. Uh, and so they're going to be building curriculum that's going to be freely available with our software, which is also freely available to every single K through 12 child in the world. And our, our, our vision is that we will build teacher capacity and student capacity uh, like crazy over the next five years. I mean, my colleague, uh, Vicki Phillips at National Geographic imagines building at least one million teachers who are GIS literate in the next five years. You think about that. <laughs> That's a lot. That's amazing. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And, and also she wants to reach 25 million students. Right now we're at about a uh, quarter million students a year that take GIS training in different schools. So this is about scaling it up. And to, re to really make that scaling up happen, uh, it isn't just teachers going to school. Uh, teachers have a full-time job. Teachers need to ha ha have friendships with people that actually are GIS professionals. And this is really where uh, I think there's a huge opportunity to have some fun by yourselves to adopt Start, I mean, start with your own kids, adopt a school, adopt a teacher, and get engaged in their teaching activities. But if you find teachers that actually are interested, then invest in them and invest in them heavy. So our, our look, I started off saying we have lots of problems in the world, and those problems are going to require people like yourselves, but times 100, people that actually get geography, get the the possibility of what integrating all kinds of information is all about to come up with integrated holistic solutions. And uh, I'm talking quickly and abstractly, but I think all of you uh, in ERISA get what I'm talking about. Building that next generation of kids that can address climate change and loss of biodiversity and better planned cities and more livable cities and smart cities and all those goals that we aspire to address, uh, well, that's going to take uh, that we're not going to be able to do it just among ourselves. We got to get a next generation going, and uh, that means uh, going full in and getting kids involved and teachers involved. So that you know, for those of you listening to this conversation, who are part of this conversation, even though you're not in these, you know, this digital realm that we're discussing this, um, let's just say that our our hope in having this conversation with Jack is that it'll inspire you to help us spread the word of what we're doing to get involved with your communities, to get involved with your local schools, and, and to be a mentor in this world because as we move forward, as we keep talking about, we can't do it ourselves on this, on this phone call. The four of us can't fix everything, but together as a community and as a society and as a group, we can, we can, we can move mountains, right? Well, I mean, geography, geographically speaking. So um, just again, thank you all so much for in, you know, being part of this conversation. And Jack, we'll look forward to catching up with you soon and you know, continuing this in the next topic. Yeah, I want to come back to New England one of these days. Just from my perspective, you know, this, this we've heard these conversations a couple of times now throughout the board as we're making clips and I'm still just blown away. I mean, I cannot, put into words how blown away I am um, to get the time to talk with Jack, to get his perspectives. And again, that discussion is really what led us into contacting National Geographic, having Faye reach out. Actually, Anastasia was mentioned. Anastasia also reached out. From the jump, there was not even a question of, like, who are you and are you on our level? It was, we love what you're doing and we want to help. So what I'd love to do first is, you know, Faye and Brandy, just get a little bit of your feedback from that video with Jack and anything that stood out to you personally. Maybe Faye, let's start with you and then we'll go to Brandy. Just sort of your initial feedback on what we just saw. Sure, absolutely, Jay. Um, what I'm really still blown away with is the fact that Jack talked about educators and students. So all of our programming at National Geographic is geared toward empowering educators and empowering students because we know that we need both to solve the world's most pressing problems. Um, and also, Jay, to just reiterate what you said is we can't do this 
uh, alone. Even National Geographic, with all that it has, can't do it alone. We rely on partnerships. That's partnerships with educators. That's partnerships with uh, other nonprofits, such as yourself, partners like Esri, because we want to get game-changing tools in the hands of both educators and students, because we know the technology like GIS is really a game changer, right? It really helps kids see the picture and tell the story of what's happening in their communities and around the world. And I remember, um, I'm gonna date myself a little bit, going back to my first time over 20 years, um, back in the day in, in the classroom, we didn't have access to tools like that, really. It was primarily in you know organizations, companies that had access to this technology. And if I can speak on behalf of Dr. Uh, Vicki Phillips, who, who you said was our chief education officer, she brought to National Geographic this huge vision around what we can do over the next five to 10 years. And I have to say, it's very ambitious goals. You heard about the 1 million um, educators that we're trying to reach and put um, this GIS in their hands. But I did want to share with you a little bit of, of, about our strategy. And if I might share my screen for just a moment, just to give you a high level overview before I kick the um, uh, can over to Brandy, is just to give you a visual picture of what we're trying to do. Okay, just a moment, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see this visual that has like three components to it. And just quickly, I'll just give you a picture of what we're trying to do. Um, I mentioned earlier that we embarked upon a new education strategy um, just over you know, six months ago. And the first part of that was to inspire this movement. So you heard uh, Jack in the video talk about this Gen Geo, Generation uh, Geography, where we're really trying to create this movement of educators and students that can help solve the most uh, pressing problems. And just to point out look, the numbers, our goal is to cultivate empathy for the earth among 1 million young people over this next decade and lift the voices of 5 million young leaders, right? That is <laughs> huge. So even though we talk about this 1 million, Think about over the next decade, 100 million young people who've cultivated empathy for the earth. And they're doing that using um, GIS technology. The second component is what you see is to equip educators, 2.5 million of those, and young people with game-changing tools such as um, uh, GIS. Um, but we also want to, what's near and dear to our heart, is kind of build the field of geography um, we know that geography is the science, right? Technology is a part of that, but really helping kids really understand the, 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 you know, the know-how of geography, both the knowledge and the content, but also how to use these tools to be able to change um, the, the face of, of our environment, both human and um, the natural world. And so again, I wanna reiterate that this is, these are ambitious goals, but we can't do them alone. We have to partner um, together um, to do these things. I'll stop sharing for a moment, just to give you a little bit of perspective on what we're trying to do here. Amazing, that's amazing. And uh, Brandy, do you wanna sort of pick up on that and give, give us some feedback on the video and you know, how it struck you and what you're thinking? Yeah, I think it's really important that he said, you know, we we need GIS professionals out there to actually be around to support the teachers. I would have no clue about GIS if it wasn't for the fact that my best friend was the GIS specialist for the town of Hamden. And her coming into my class, it changed my entire perspective on teaching geography. And I know a lot of the older geography teachers um, are really hesitant about grabbing on to the technology. Um, I have a colleague who still has his kids do cartograms and like they are filling in the little boxes and I'm pulling up bouncy maps and making cartograms for the kids and things like that so that they can see how the technology works and they embrace that so much more. Um, so it is, it's really important because we have these students who are, you know, living in a digital age um, to 
have teachers who know how to use this technology in different ways um, and having people you know have our back to be able to support us you know that's really important <clears throat> that's really amazing and you know I, something that i first thought of when national geographic came up was you know when i was younger i was the kid who had like national geographic subscriptions i was the kid who you know was blown away by the photography <clears throat> and you know to phase point she said she was dating herself i'll date myself a little bit back when i was a kid national geographic from my perspective was a periodical you know i mean it was a it was mostly a print magazine. I know there were a lot of other things going on, but to me at the time, that was what they were probably best known for. And I might be simplifying that, but in a sense, from the, per, from the perspective of a, of a person living in this world, that's how I knew them. Part of the discussion here also that we really found intriguing was National Geographic has really had to adapt to the new times. And I think that when you adapt to new things, generally it's adopting technology and realizing we're either gonna adapt or we're going to not succeed. We've seen a lot of you know, newspapers. My wife is actually a librarian, so books in this house are, are reverent. Um, but the reality is we're moving to eBooks, we're moving away from paper, right? And so I, I think one of the challenges is actually taking on the idea of let's fight upstream here because I know there's still, you know, National Geographic periodicals out there. But I think the incredible thing is when you come out of the tunnel of technology and out of the tunnel of innovation, what you all have been able to accomplish from National Geographic and how you've been able to change educators' lives. And so my, my next question kind of goes into, can you talk a little, Faye, about like the next generation of geographers and the things that National Geographic is really focusing on with that? And then Brandy, following that up, sort of what you've seen in your classroom with with kids these days, let's say, and you know what what kinds of things you're seeing that make the biggest difference in um, young geographers or students' lives to introduce GI, uh, National Geographic to them. Asking that. So a couple things that I'll point out that we're doing to kind of, you know, up the ante on the work that we're doing. One of it, you mentioned the print uh, periodical, right? So one of the things that we're doing to put this game changing content into the hands of educators is for some of you might be familiar with our Explorer magazine, which it previously has been a subscription based magazine for the classroom um, that teachers, educators had to um, purchase for their classroom and it came with a curriculum. Well, starting this year, and actually it started with the onset of COVID-19 earlier this year, we've made that um, previously print um, magazine totally digital now. And so now educators have access to this high level content, but in a virtual uh, manner. And it's free, totally free now. Um, and inside that, that magazine is what you will expect to find is connections to technology. You'll see, you know, um, that science and social studies content that we're talking about that's critical for, for students to know, to be able to take on the mindset of an explorer, mindset of a, of, um, a geographer, uh, but it's at no expense whatsoever to them. And we also have um, a Spanish version to that. Um, and one of the things is what we like to say is our secret sauce at National Geographic are our explorers, right? And so kids get introduced to what explorers do on a database, uh, daily basis, but also what like some of our National Geographic staff, like Alex Tate, who is uh, it's the coolest title ever, the National Geographic geographer, right? And he's super cool. And one of the uh, things that we've done in this magazine is we featured his work so that kids can see a new face of geography. It's not your grandma's and grandpa's geography class anymore, even when I taught it, you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, it really shows kids how they use technology like GIS to really understand the planet. And one of the things that I'm, if that's really cool and one of um, the issues of the magazine is Alex Tate takes us on the expedi expedition to Everest where kids get to see why is studying Mount Everest so important and how does that help us understand the climate, understand 
you know, the changing climate, changing planet, and why we should care about that. And he also talks about how to use ge uh, geospatial technology to help kids see those patterns and make connections to what, what's happening in the world. I mean, I can go on and on about what we're doing, but just to give you a little snippet, and one last thing I'll point out that we're also doing is leaning into the use of VR, virtual reality, um, augmented reality, uh, artificial intelligence. These are tools that our, our um, explorers are using out in the field and our labs team is harnessing that in an education space to help us bring expeditions into the classroom in ways that kids would never have access to it because we can't always go where our explorers go. But they can also use these ideas to tell the story about what's happening in their own backyard. So exploration is not just Everest. Exploration is what's happening right in your own neighborhood and how can you solve those problems as well. That's incredible, Faye. I appreciate that. Brandy, anything that uh, sticks out to you from what Faye was saying or what we were talking about? So I teach high school, but I also have a five-year-old and kids mimic what we do. Um, and I'm obsessed with both Esri and National Geographic. Like they are staples in my household. So I have the National Geographic magazine. My daughter gets the National Geographic kids and the National Geographic Kids, it's amazing. It comes with inserts. Her Christmas list, she wants National Geographic Lego sets. Like they have those out there for kids now so that she can learn about the explorers. Um, when I went to National Geographic, I brought her back a National Geographic Barbie. It's her absolute favorite Barbie. Um, so there are things like that. Those That's the new generation of geographers that they're seeing that, you know, it's they can go out and they can become these explorers themselves. Um, I use the explorers in my classroom. Um, Sarah Parkek is um, a graduate of Bangor High School. So, and if you don't know who Sarah Parkek is, she is Indy from space. She is Indiana Jones from space. She uses LIDAR and remote sensing to find all of these amazing archeological sites in Egypt. Um, and we, so I show my kids like her Colbert interview and um, her TED Talks because she came from where these kids have been sitting and she uses geospatial technology to, you know, find amazing things. Um, and it really, it makes it real for them and it makes it so that they feel that they can do things as well. That's incredible. That's incredible. I love that perspective. And you know, that's why like the next discussion for the meeting is that aha moment, right? So when did the light go on for you? When did you realize what this could do? And I think that part of that starts with what you're saying, Brandy, trying to get that light to turn on an earlier age, because by giving real pieces of solid work that's been done and giving a, giving that timestamp, you know, anchor in time to say this person this thing here's what this person's done they started out where you are and here's where they are i think that that perspective is really important because sometimes to to gis professionals i think we probably don't do a good enough job explaining what the work is and how do you get from being a student in your class to going into college to then ending up in the gis field and I think that it's it's the one thing we're struggling with the most. Um, there's a there's a survey that went around that we were looking at where it's not necessarily people. It seems like there's interest in GIS up until high school, and there can be interest in GIS through college, but then getting those people to actually join the GIS profession is where we're losing people. So I think it's it's showing them that path and putting the breadcrumbs down the whole way so they can just follow step by step. And that's where with Nurissa, what we're really trying to do, like I said, is bridge that gap and, and, and help to pick up people. We're really looking at elementary and, and, and uh, then you know, high school and moving forward. You know, with my president's mission this year, the challenge was get out into your schools and your communities and make a difference. And um, I can personally say that for the last, well, last year, because of COVID, it was canceled, but uh, my daughter is in third grade now. Her kindergarten classroom, I went to the classroom and brought maps and things. 
and taught the kindergarten kids about the basics of maps. So what, what makes the map? What does the map need? Um, I put together a project for them so they could actually make a map of their bedroom. And I gave them all cardboard pieces where they can lay out things. And I, I want them to visualize, right? Because spatial understanding, it's more than knowing what the lat long is is something, but it's thinking about the orientation of something over space and time. So to me, I would say to them, let's walk down the hallway like you're walking to your bedroom. Okay, great. You get to your doorway, you look in your room. What are you looking at? You know, then we talk about top view, side view. We can build on that, but the basics, scale, what involves in the map, you know, the symbologies, legends, things like that, they picked up on instantly. The next year in first grade, I followed up with the same kids. It's a very small class. And we, 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 I decided they were talking about the rainforest. So I went in and talked to them about static versus dynamic maps, how to understand the difference and how we're using things. And the reality is my hope is if I can keep that going with them as they get older, right, they'll hopefully be thinking about this as they get into other choices. When you get into middle school and you can choose an elective, could they choose GIS as an elective? And I'm trying to also meet with the, the head of school and have her think about adopting GIS and the software so the kids can really dive into it. Um, so I'd like to hear from you, Faye, and from you, Brandy. You know, with that being said, and Eurys is trying to help you, what, you know, what role can the GIS professional play in helping teachers? You know, Brandy, you mentioned how, what a big deal it was to have your best friend come in and open that door for you. So what is the best way you think GIS professionals can really be a benefit to this process? Can I jump in on this way? No, sure, please do. So um, I had a lot of students, um, I teach a GIS class typically this year, everything's kind of up in the air because of COVID, but I typically have a GIS class and I've had students who have done awesome work. Um, and one of my students went to city council and proposed a new bike trail um, and got it approved through the city. Um, and he worked on an independent study with me last year because he wants to be a developer. That's, that's his goal. And I encouraged him like, oh, well, you should go into being a developer for geospatial technology because you're really, you know, you like it. It's, and there's always jobs out there for it. Um, and he really would have liked to have had some type of GIS type internship over the summer. Um, or job shadowing experience where he could go in. And all the internships that are out there are for college kids. Um, there's not much out there for younger kids to go in and actually, you know, get a chance to experience what it's like to be a GIS professional before they go off to college and decide what they're going to do. Um, and I think that would be something that would be awesome is if, you know, some professionals you know, offered job shadowing or internship type things that high school kids could come in and get that experience. I echo um, Brandy's sentiments. I think that is critically important. Um, I also um, would offer up, uh, prior to joining National Geographic, I was the director of social studies at our State Department of Ed. And we know that every single um, state has a set of standards that they have to uh, incorporate into the classroom. And one of the things that teachers get wary around, and I, I know Brandy, you probably can attest to this. Fortunately for you, you can offer up a GIS course, but that's not likely in a lot of um, schools and districts around the country. So one of the things that I think GIS professionals can do is partner with districts and schools and find out what their standards are and figure out ways to authentically incorporate GIS. People need to see what it looks like before they are willing to do it. And I wanted to share a couple of things with you to also go back to what Jay said about starting early. Um, our education strategy is really um, a K-12 strategy when it comes to education, but it also is really a K-16 going moving into college as well, because we also have to think about, you know, where we start with the elementary, but obviously where we also want to go in terms of those young professionals. So I put in the chat some research that we did around spatial thinking for elementary, um, because it's, it's really bridging that gap between what happens in um, classrooms and then what happens in the profession. 
And sometimes as educators, we don't always know what's happening out in the field, right, with true professionals. And so we lack that connection. And sometimes professionals, GIS professionals might be a little weary with thinking about going into the classroom because they say, I'm not a teacher, I'm not an educator. So there's some tools out there that can help bridge that gap in terms of language for both of those. Some of it is around the research, but some of it is around just those, those resources that really um, help make those connections. So that's one thing. The second thing is think about, you, if you can't go into every single classroom, think about making some videos that just show your work in action. So we've worked with some of our explorers to, to do some videos of like their work in action, like in their lab or out in the field that we can share. And for those of you who might not be familiar, um, we have what's called Explorer Classroom. And this very easily could be called Geography Classroom or GIS Classroom, where we use our YouTube channel to bring explorers into the classroom or into the home, because now we're learning at home. So that might be another opportunity. Um, in this summer, we had an opportunity to, um, for the high school kids, is really do something called Gen Geo Careers where we introduced um, every, I think it was every Friday, kids to different um, geography-based um, uh, careers so kids can see what those things are and be able to, to mimic those. So those are a few things um, that you might think about. And then finally, um, we have on our website, our whole education website, I also put that in the chat, where you can search on resources that connects um, GIS um, to the classroom. And we have a whole collection um, in our resource library that helps um, educators and also GIS professionals understand, make, help make that bridge between, you know, what's happening in the, in the profession and then what, what's happening in the classroom. Kind of moves me to the next thing I want to ask about, which is a great segue. Good job. Um, you know, so, so we, we hear about maybe what the GIS professional can do to help it really sounds like getting involved, which is sort of the theme of this conference, right? I mean, not, just so everyone hears it, and from, from my perspective, this is this is me, right? Nothing's going to change if we don't make it change. We've seen it now. We've seen society, you know, this conference is really a microcosm of all the pieces of discussion that we want to have about society and what's happening. Nothing is going to change. You know, I'll say it right now, get out and vote. If you don't like what's happening, go vote. If you don't like what's happening in your schools, if you don't like that there's not enough ge geographic information or geographic education, get out and make a difference. That's that's what I'm gonna say to you. Yes, there is a part about donating all of your time so it's really diluting the effort, but what I'll say to you is start, try. Get out there and talk to your schools. Let your, let your kids' teachers know that you're interested in helping them with GIS. That's the message you're hearing from Brandy and Faye and that makes sense to me because, again, the thing I know about educators, I said my wife's a librarian, and she is. She started off as an educator. And the one thing I can tell you is when it's go time with IEPs and lesson plans and everybody's got their own, you know, unique take on that, I, you know, when you try and bring up the idea of integrating technology, the first answer is we don't have time for that. I don't have time to learn this thing because I'm on the front lines of what's happening and there's being so much asked of me anyway, then caveat that with COVID and now what educators are being asked to do with virtual, non-virtual, you know, all these things, it really stacks up to being an impossible ask. So with that being said, Faye and, and Brandy, I'd love to hear Faye about National Geographic's content for educators and students um, you said something in our previous discussion, how you're going direct to educators and students now. And then, and then Brandy, you know, your take on how you've been able to use those resources and really make a difference in your classroom. It'd be great to hear about that. Um, absolutely. So um, you heard also, Jack, talk about the curriculum that we're developing. We started out last year where, with a set of curricular units on our website, and I'll make sure I put the, the link in there um, so that you can see it. Um, that is based on using embedding GIS into that curriculum, but also exposing um, 
students and educators to the work that our explorers are doing. That's one thing. Um, now we're also leaning into developing some curricular resources to support elementary because we believe that's a foundation and that we have to close that gap um, between what happens in elementary school. And, and I must say, it's admirable that your um, wife, Jay, is an, a librarian because I believe that librarians, uh, media coordinators are the probably you know, untapped resource, the, the most important untapped resource in a school because they have the ability to find all of these resources and bring those to both educators and kids. So lean more into, into your librarians and schools. Um, so we are, we also have, and I think in the chat, um, uh, a website that we have over 6,000 items free of charge that educators and families can use to bring that. Um, that kind of high level content um, into their classroom. Um, and then most recently, we're starting to lean into the use of the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a platform to get us to think about those most pressing issues in our um, society, in our world, and how we might solve them. But I also would love to, the last thing I would say about that is that it's really important, not that it's just National Geographic creating these resources, but we are partnering and co-creating directly with educators, right? Because we know they are on the front lines, Jay, as you um, articulated. They are the ones that know their students best and what their needs are. So, you know, while we believe that we have really great content, we only believe that because we have educators like Brandy that it's helping us to create that. And we have wonderful partnerships with experts like Esri to also help us um, create this high level content. I use the content all the time in my classroom. Um, I'm constantly searching. I may not use it in exactly the manner that it's on there. I may tweak it to be what I need for my classroom, but like we're going into our unit on climate change. Um, and first thing I do when I'm looking for lessons is I go to the Nat Geo site and I look for what I can find on there. Um, and during remote learning, that's, that was my go-to, um, was Nat Geo, because there's things, there's so many different levels for different kids. And our goal through remote learning was make sure that the kids' emotional health was important, but I still felt it was very important for my students to be learning something. So I would go in and I would find like three different levels of similar assignments, and I would give them the option um, to be able to do those. Um, and it could have been a geo inquiry that Esri has um, it and where they're playing with the maps and answering questions that way. Um, there's one on there I love that's called a river puzzle that I actually you know, went through and did screenshots and cut it up so that they could move it around on a Google slide digitally. Um, and then from there, they actually went in and did a river analysis. Um, with GIS. Um, so there's just so much that you can build on that's in that repertoire. You know, I think that that's, that's where I sort of start with the discussion with Jack also, and where my mind started is, um, you know, having the ability to get content, having the ability to introduce this to younger generations. I know, and this is an example I know of, I know in California, they have GIS education woven into elementary. Because the reality is, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak directly to GIS professionals. I'm sorry for saying this, but the reality is, sometimes the beginning techniques of what we do are not overly difficult. You can bring data into a GIS. You can symbolize things and hit print. It's not going to be the prettiest thing you've seen, but I think the earlier that we get into that mode of dealing with data by layers, understanding symbologies and how different aspects lay out with each other. I mean, kids can do that. They're very good at understanding patterns and colors. And you know, you ask a kid which map looks better, they're probably gonna tell you the one that looks better because they understand what, lo what looks nice to them. Um, and so I, you know, to me, I think it's really important to take advantage of these resources. And that's why with our support a teacher program and initiative, we're really trying to, bridge that gap and become, you know, open people's eyes to it and then be able to say, great, your eyes are open. Go talk, go see what National Geographic and Esri are doing. Go understand what's at your fingertips as an educator that you can go and download, 
you know, lesson plans. And really what you said, Brandy, to me, if you're downloading it at different levels, I know that in the IEP process, it's all about showing students things different ways. And that's the thing about GIS I always talk about, which is there are more than, you know, there's many ways of doing something. My process for doing it, your process, everybody else's process might be different and we might get the same answer at the end. So it, it's, it's ways, that's what I love about GIS. If you're very logic based with data, you can come at it on the programming data side and end up still getting to where you wanna be. If you're more of an artistic person, you can come at it with the data layout and the layout and design side and still get to where you need to be. I, I, I think about to myself, you know, I used to play a lot of Trivial Pursuit when I was a kid, again, dating myself, right? But, you know, there was a category called arts and sciences, right? So it's like, there's a reason these two things go together. And I think that GIS and National Geographic really do a great job of, of tying those two things together. Um, you know, during our talk, Faye, you also mentioned the idea of putting a new face on geography and, you know, finding a new way to brand geography to people. And I'll put a quick segment to that. When we talked to Rebecca Jones about her discussion, she brought up an interesting point about people being either being called data scientists or geographers. And as GIS professionals, I love bringing the term geographer back because that's where we all started. So Faye, would you talk a little bit about the idea of, of giving a new face to geography and what you mean by that? Oh, absolutely, Jay. Um, thank you for that question, right? So yeah, sometimes um, if I might, might say this, that geography, the name geography itself doesn't seem like a sexy thing for people. Like people are not leaning into like geography. In fact, when you look across the country and you look at graduation requirements, we're really lacking there. Um, when we look at, you know, what the expectations are. And even when you look at colleges of education, you don't see, and we hear from our um, higher ed partners, that people are not really um, getting degrees in geography anymore. So we, that, that new face of geography is really about some of the things that National Geographic does well too, like storytelling, using the power of maps to tell a story. Um, if you Think back for, for some of you who've seen our campaign around uh, planet or plastics um, and you see the maps, that map tell a story about where, you know, the, the damage is being done around um, plastic pollution in our oceans, right? And so that new face is really, obviously we want kids to be spatially aware, but really kids nowadays in any content area really wanna know the why, the compelling why for content to, to know and they want to be able to do. And I think that's why the partnership with Esri is so important because it builds that, that collaboration between our secret sauce of explorers and exploration and science and technology, et cetera, with Esri's platform of ArcGIS. And bringing those things together helps kids see visually what you can do with that power of technology in the, the content of geography. So we're really doing that, but we're also leaning into the power of young people, right? It's, it's educators, of course, because they're the ones that's pro that are on the front lines and will um, probably be the ones that really introduce kids to this technology and, and content. But really that part of the direct to, to youth is things that we're doing uh, on our, um, with our youth team. And I'm gonna put a link to a blog in our chat that shows you our 2020 um, young explorers. And th these are um, young people ages 15 to 25 that are really becoming the leaders in geography education, right? They're the, the young explorers that are out there problem solving and bringing other people um, into the fold. So when you talk about that new face, it really is the young people. Uh, because if you think about across, you know, time, when you see these major social movements happening, they are led by young people. And so geography, that new face has to be with these young folks and we have to give them the tools and, and the skills to be able to, to solve these most pressing problems. That's amazing. And, and Brandy, can you maybe just, you know, have you seen a change? You said you've been teaching for a while. I mean, with the idea of putting a new face on, ge on geography, are you seeing movement there? I mean, you mentioned a very um, awesome success story. So I guess I'm, I'm gonna guess the answer is yes, but, but can you go into a little bit about your perspective on that? 
I have, and I I've been working like my my main goal is to spread ge geographic education, and I work with the main Department of Education to do that. But um, we are really pushing right now to see geography as more than just a social studies because that's where it is in our standards. Um, I've been working with our STEM department um, to get them on board and they have completely adopted um, geospatial technology um, in some of their courses. But it, it is, it's a, it's a process and we need to, people need to understand that geography is not just one subject. It is everything. And I think until like teachers really see that, um, we're not going to get that movement. So I think that's one of the good things that we've seen with COVID is that teachers are now starting to see that, oh, wait, everything is interconnected. And the dashboards that were put out um, through COVID, I know many teachers who have been using those throughout many subjects, whether it math for statistics, um, health classes. Um, and so I, I'm starting to see that they're really, you know, grabbing onto those, those dashboards and seeing that there's so much more that you can do with this. Um, and I mean, my kids, they started out, we started watching the COVID dashboards from John Hopkins in January because the kids, they saw it on the news and they wanted to know. And it's like, oh, look, it's nothing. Like, what's, it's not even impacting us. And then like, we were watching it every day. And so they got to see the progression of that. And so they're, the kids are really starting to see that, wait, this isn't just a social studies. And I have kids coming to me now a lot more in their different subject areas. I had a kid come to me on Friday and ask me if I could set up a new org account for him because he, um, he he just had his generic account from when he was in geography class, but he wanted to do a whole project for his chemistry class and wanted to know if I could get him logged back in. And so we did that. So they're really starting to see that this technology that I'm teaching them as freshmen is really going with them throughout different subject areas as they go through high school. That's amazing. I really appreciate that feedback. And, you know, it makes me think because that's the other part of this, right? I mean, I know that I mentioned that I'm the GIS manager for the Rhode Island Department of Health. And something I'm finding in the health field, um, as I've been speaking with Tufts University and some other universities about GIS and public health, for instance, is that, you know, most people have a fairly dated understanding of what GIS is right? It's, it's not only what it was, but to them what it is. I mean, to most people, GIS is have a printed map and here you go. But as I mentioned earlier, static versus dynamic data, we're in a dynamic world now. Everything that we're doing in GIS is, well, a major par part of the movement in GIS at this point is through online engagement and taking data and using ArcGIS Online as an example of a suite of applications where you can take your information and share it with the public. And so, and if you add that to um, applications like the ArcGIS Hub site that we're using for the conference or ArcGIS Story Maps where you can really lay out your topics and information, but embed maps, embed applications into these tech platforms. And also I mentioned at the beginning of the conference, Survey123 moving away from like a Google poll where you can just collect information. How about collecting information and the geospatial relation with that person? So that when you start uh, aggregating results and looking at results, you can also understand that over space and time. I think that honestly, part of this whole thing for us is letting people know where GIS is now. Because if people came to National Geographic and, and Faye only talked to you about a magazine, you would say to them, well, we're so much more than that now. And I think that's what we're trying to do with GIS also is to open that door and show people, you know, that there's more to what we're doing than just printing a map for you or, you know, or creating a line of a road. So um, I think it's really important. Um, I'm seeing it a lot up here in Maine. Um, it used to be that with the University of Maine, forestry was the only 
thing that used GIS. Um, so if you were in the forestry major, you, you were a GIS pro, but it's really expanding. Um, University of Maine Machias, some of you might know Tora Johnson. She's really pushed the GIS program um, and now their environmental science is actually environmental GIS. Um, and it's really started to move into a lot more majors, um, which is what I tell my students is that, you know, it doesn't really matter what subject you're going into for college, this technology is gonna help you. Are you gonna go into government? All right, here you go. Are you gonna be a politician? Look, you need to have this technology to figure out who your constituents are. So um, it's really starting to expand in the university. And if students in younger grades understand, you know, how it can impact the career choice that they want to go into, I think that would be a huge help to a lot of the teachers. Yeah, I, I would echo Brandy's sentiments and, and I'll share uh, two things that we're doing in this area. One is we partnered with Esri to rebuild our MapMaker Interactive tool. And we see it as kind of an on-ramp to ArcGIS where both kids and students can get a fundamental understanding. I know when I first started looking at ArcGIS, I was super intimidated by it. But now, you know, we have so many, so much training and we've made the tools easier for both kids and, and mostly adults, right? Because kids will take the tool and figure it out. They won't break it, right? They, they will fit, figure it out. But for adults to be able to use it and figure out how to um, integrate that into their classroom. And then the second tool I'll mention, I think, Brandon, you, you um, pointed this out early on, is the use of our geo inquiry process which is, you know, every state is leaning into inquiry, right? How do we use questions and pose questions about the most pressing issues and challenges in our neighborhoods and around the world? But critical to that is really data and using that data and visualizing it in a way that makes sense to a layperson, right? So ArcGIS, GIS General is um, a tool that can help um, really do that. Um, and I, I'm, as you talked about it, um, when, when you were speaking, Jay, um, it brought um, to mind one of our Nat Geo fellows from 2018 who was using the geo inquiry process to train his um, middle school kids on how to go into the neighborhoods and find water sources of uh, water in their neighborhoods or, or water filling stations. And they used Survey 123 as a tool to be able to identify where these things are. And so it becomes part, part of Gen Geo, it becomes natural for kids to, to use this technology on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I would really like to echo Brandy's sentiments about when you think about geography, because the discipline is so integrative, anyway, that you should think about the use of this technology, GIS, and geography in every single discipline you can imagine. And especially at the elementary grades, integrate, they're all about integration because they teach everything. And so to your point, Jay, about teachers being busy, we have to give them tools that's going to be easy and simple for them to integrate. Um, and what we've been talking about here today and around building partnerships is one way to take the load off the teacher and make gives them easy access to these tools. I had a math teacher talk about something that he was doing about um, he was going out and they were trying to figure out how tall a tower was. And I was like, map algebra. And he was like, what? And I was like, look, I could show you how to do this on this tool. But a lot of teachers just don't want to learn this new technology. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of teachers are already doing it. And if the kids have the know how for the technology, even if the teacher isn't saying, oh, map algebra, they can be like, oh, that's map algebra. And I can go in and do this on this program because they have a little bit of background with it. That is awesome. I really appreciate that. You know, as I was talking about, you know, the new age of GIS, as I've been calling it, I saw a comment from the audience that Rebecca Jones is here. And, you know, I think it goes to show even more um, the work that she's doing with dashboarding. Um, you know, the reality, and this, this goes into the greater conversation, most people use GIS on a daily, daily basis, but do not realize what they're doing. I graduated school in 2010. A little bit of an older college graduate, but um, I was focused. But, um, you know, but when I graduated school in 2010, think about it. Ten years ago, phones were just getting Google Maps. 
Um, Arc Online just came out. And 10 years later, we're at a point in time now where if you're using Google Maps on your phone, you are using GIS. Welcome to the GIS world. If you're looking at a weather map, if you're looking at, as Joey mentioned, election results, all GIS. The uh, Johns Hopkins operations dashboard is a 100% Esri operations dashboard application. And Rebecca's work that she's doing with the Florida COVID action is all GIS. So it's, it's just when we're looking at data now, more often than not, if you have any type of a geographic, a state, a census tract, a zip code, a town boundary, anything to show you what's happening at that point in time, you are using GIS. So Faye, what I'd like to do is ask one more question to you and then we'll move into a little bit of Q&A with the audience. My question to you is, Faye, I know we talked a little bit about moving forward and partnering up with Nerissa to try and help you push your agenda and what you're trying to do. So what can we, what's the real takeaway here? What's the action item for us to move forward and really help you make a difference? Oh, great. Another great question, Jay. <laughs> um, and we love this. Well, first of all, I think it's one step, and I think you've already said this, Jay, is go to schools and districts and say, simply, how can I help, right? Um, I think teachers can give you a list of things um, that you can do to help support them really understanding the technology and also integrating those into their classroom. Um, and I would um, say to you is to keep it simple, stupid, right? The KISS method, right? Um, sometimes we are intimidated um, as adults by this, what we see as new technology because we haven't been exposed to it. So take baby steps, right? You know, it could be offering up um, some a webinar series where teachers can go and learn fundamentally and not be intimidated and afraid and they can ask questions in a safe space on how to use this technology. That's one thing. Um, and that's, that's really our direct to teacher um, uh, initiative. But also inviting teachers like Brandy, who's already familiar with the technology in a super user. Um, I'll tell you at our education summit last year, I had an aha moment about the use of GIS because teachers were doing presentations on how, I mean, we had the Esri gurus there too, but I actually learned best from the teacher. Yes. <laughs> I said, Brandy, yes. I learned best when I heard it come from a teacher. You spoke my language, Brandy, and I could really understand the implications uh, and applications in the classroom with real kids, right? So invite teachers to be a part of that conversation. Um, and then thirdly, I would say our direct to um, youth initiative is then invite kids to learn the technology. Because while we are really pushing classroom use of the technology, we also know that there is inequity, right? In, in schools around the country when it comes to the use of GIS. So we don't want to, um, let the fact that a teacher might be uh, uncomfortable and not ready to use the technology to prevent kids from having access. So the Scouts is a good opportunity to partner with as well. You know, the Boys and Girls Club is another opportunity. After school programs, right? Whatever community programs, you know, faith-based organizations, wherever you can find kids, that's where we need to take the technology. So the partnership is not just, you know, one or the other it really is about building community. So when you hear us talk about that Gen Geo movement, it really is about empowering young people to take on those roles, not just adults. So those are three things that I would offer up as a way for um, us to partner with Nerissa moving forward, but also for the GIS community to pull together and use your platform and your expertise to build the confidence of youth um, and educators and also families. Amazing, amazing, I appreciate that. Uh, so Brandy, any, any thoughts on, the thing I wanna bring up to you, Brandy, and, and maybe Faye, if you have an idea, you know, so we're having our Mapathon tomorrow and we're really trying to introduce, again, like to Brandy's point, most high school students aren't getting an opportunity to see what GIS professionals do or how we can make a change with GIS. So with the Mapathon sessions tomorrow, and like, like I mentioned, you know, any high school students or anybody who wants to join, we'll train them up to where they need to be. But coming up for GIS Day next month, we're really hoping to put on a mapathon for educators and for students. And so I'd just like to get your feedback, Brandy, on, 
if you know some things we should maybe think about for challenges in terms of that or you know maybe the best way to roll that out because again you know as you look at our hub site and you see the where all of our um our attendees are coming from this has become an international conference because we don't have any borders with having to be in new england for the conference so we see that as being an opportunity to you know as we use slack for communication and um you know the open street map for uh, mapping that we can really reach out to people who aren't in new england and try and grow that so i guess to, to my first question wh what should we be thinking about moving forward to really make sure we're including everyone well i mean schools really need i, I know so many teachers who do not understand that this is a free technology that that all K-12 schools in the U.S. get this technology for free. Um, and I think that's something that really needs to get put out more and more and more because, you know, teachers here free and they're like, oh, I'm all about that. Um, so it's, you know, in the, the fact that it's so expensive for anybody who's a GIS professional to get ArcGIS. Um, and I mean, Esri is the number one, but there are other companies out there that offer free technology. Um, I'm from Maine, so Blue Marble. Um, Blue Marble offers free, but you know, the ability for Blue Marble to run on Chromebooks, like um, ArcGIS Online, isn't quite there. Um, so ArcGIS Online allows people to be able to you know, use it on, the, on whatever device that they have. So that's, that's a really nice thing, um, but teachers just need to know. They need to know that there are org accounts out there. Um, groups need to know that there are group accounts. So if you have a Girl Scout group or a Boy Scout group, you can get a free account for those. Esri has those club accounts now. Um, so those are things that just like, you know, so if you're talking to people that you know run clubs or in education, tell them, you know, you can get this for free, you know, just Google, you know, K-12 Esri education, and you'll find everything that you need to know. And Charlie will set you up like that. It's, it's pretty easy. Um, but if, t I think if more teachers know about it, then they'll play with it. Um, because it is fun once you get on there and get messing around and, you know, story maps are just so easy. I use story maps instead of PowerPoints now. So, absolutely, that's that's incredible. That's actually me too. I've started using, and and that's to Brandy's point. And let's be clear, right? We are not an Esri company. We're not. We're not. You know, it, Esri happens to be in most of our lives the leading software package. And I do agree that their ability to be used on most all platforms is very convenient. But to Brandy's point, there's open, there's QGIS, there's other GIS sources. You mentioned Blue Marble. Patrick is a uh, is a Nurissa board alum, so we love that. And that's the thing. Just because we have Jack and we're, you know, we're so excited to meet with him. You're right. There are other ways of doing GIS outside of Esri. I think that Esri makes it the easiest. But again, it's a great point. So let's let's do this. Let's go to some Q and A because we're we have about five minutes left and see where we get. So I want to introduce Pam Locke. Good timing, Pam. Pam is our immediate past president. Um, it's been incredible working with her on the board. And honestly, so everyone here is Pam is an exemplary president. She has really paved the way for all of us to learn. Um, so Pam's gonna step on and help us with a little bit of Q and A here. So what do you think, Pam? Thank you for those words, Jay. Very, very nice to hear. Um, so we have a few questions from our audience. Um, one is, so you mentioned that National Geographic's goal was to get 1 million teachers GIS literate. Um, do you know about how many teachers right now are using GIS? Do you have a ballpark figure for that? Actually, I, I do not um, know exactly how many teachers we have right now. Um, I know we're working hard and um, one of the th reasons why we don't know all the numbers right now is because we have started to redesign our MapMaker Interactive tool, which the basis of that is um, GIS. And so hopefully this fall, sometime in November, crossing our fingers, we will be ready uh, to unveil that. So a lot of our work is in the uh, very early stages. Um, and so we're, we're also um, really trying to find out what the needs are 
for uh, for educators. So we don't have the exact numbers, but um, but we're working on it. Well, we'll have to check back in November, see how you're doing. <laughs> um, this next question is for Brandy. Um, so how often are you using GIS in your classroom? Do you use it daily, weekly? I, daily? I use it daily. We start every day with an Esri Geo inquiry, which are like 15 minute activities. Um, and we go through that. They have the link. They get to play around on their Chromebooks with it. Um, so we, we use it daily. And like I said, I, instead of PowerPoints, I, I do everything on a story map. So they see that platform daily. Um, yeah, we, we are on it all the time. <laughs> awesome. And you mentioned um, uh, showing GIS to STEM classes, but have you presented it to any other classes like an English class or, you know, language class or something? I have um, in the past, um, haven't in the school I'm in right now, but I have worked with English teachers before using it. Um, I, I had one teacher who was using it. Um, she was doing um, li uh, literary maps. So like they would map out Jack Kerouac um, and things like that. And um, she, she was loving it. There are also geo inquiries on the Esri site for um, all subject areas. So English language arts is on there. They have the crucible. So it like goes over like demographics from Salem during that time. And um, so there's some really great resources out there. Awesome. Okay, next question. Um, GIS is the secret behind the scenes technology that so many people in the mainstream don't even recognize. Does this have an impact on how National Geographic's curriculum is being developed? Um, oh, that's a great question. I don't, I don't think it has like um, a negative impact on the way our curriculum is built. I think it helps us to inform what systems and structures and tools we need to have in place to support educators. Um, and that also speaks to the fact that we are not just building this in isolation, that we're relying heavily on educators like Brandy to help us build that curriculum um, and also to tell us what the needs are for educators. Um, and then secondly, I think uh, a part of that is that we're partnering with organizations like Esri, um, right, that already has a platform and they have um, teacher professionals that they're already using to help train teachers on how to use that technology. So I think it's just that we have to lean in a little bit harder. Awesome. Um, and let's see, we only have like a minute left, right, Jay? Yeah. All right, so this last question is maybe a little off topic, but one of our board members' sons loves uh, all the Nat Geo shows on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> Do you um, have any way to integrate GIS into those shows or are there already programmings on the Disney Plus channel that uh, kids can watch about GIS and geography? Uh, that's another great question. In, in talking with uh, Doc, Dr. Vicki Phillips, who's our chief education officer, she is in the talk, in, um, talks with our, our Disney partner. Um, and so just so you guys know, just a little bit of behind the scenes. So uh, about three years ago, um, we became a nonprofit and all of our kind of uh, video, TV, magazines became our for-profit. So we're kind of two companies working in partnership with each other. And so part of that partnership is, and Disney came on about a year and a half ago, is really figuring out how we work smarter with Disney because of that platform. So I would say, again, Pam, stay tuned. There are some things in the works um, on how we might build a field through using that Disney Plus platform. So that's a great question. Keep watching. <laughs> I've seen awesome. it with Carmen San Diego on Netflix. So I've actually like I've used um, well Google has one, but I I'm more of a art GIS girl instead of Google. So um, I I've played around in creative things for Carmen San Diego in art GIS, so that the kids can watch that and and follow along and do some questions on. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right. Well, listen. I think we are running up against time, which is fine. We have some built-in buffer. But what I love to do is Faye and Brandy give you each a chance to kind of sum things up in your own mind and then I'll come back and give a final goodbye and then we'll move on to the next thing. But this has been, you know, Faye, I have to tell you that leaving our first discussion with you on the phone, you know, or the Zoom before, we were all blown away with where this might go and 
This has been such an informative, really interesting discussion with you all. So, uh, Faye, do you want to start in, in any kind of closing remarks you have, and then Brandy will go to you? Sure, Jay. Thank you. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time with uh, you guys and looking forward to some future conversations around how we might um, continue to support the Northeast in this work. Um, I would iterate, reiterate um, that while, again, National Geographic is this huge brand and we have a lot of um, resources at our disposal, that we can't do this work alone. And we rely heavily on educators and partners to, to do this work, um, both to tell us what's working, but also to tell us what's not working um, and what, where we need to go. So we have this huge, huge ambitious goal of, you know, a direct to educator and direct to student programming. We're really trying to cultivate that curiosity. And we know that GIS is one of those game changing tools that can do that. And so if you have any ideas out there about where we can take this further, we would love to hear from you. Um, Jay, please feel free to share uh, my email address because we, um, we really want to, to reach out to folks. But um, finally, I would say it's partner, partner, partner. Partner with Nerissa. Um, in just the last few weeks in getting to know these guys, this is an incredible organization that um, can only push the work that you do um, further. Um, and so I would say that rely on educators like Brandy. She is a phenom, as you can see uh, from what you heard uh, today. But also, secondly, lean into youth, because what we're also building that you should stay tuned um, for is really leaning into youth, being able to share the, their message and their talents and their expertise. So it's not just educators training students, but it's also using the power of young people to train us all and to lead us all. Um, and so I think that's the work that we're trying to do at National Geographic. We invite you to, um, to join us, but we also want to join you as well. And thank you for the opportunity to share with you today. That's amazing, Faye. Honestly, we're, you know, when you mentioned to us the idea of this being the beginning of this relationship, it's been such an awesome beginning. I'm looking forward to seeing where this is going. And believe me when I tell you, we are all dedicated to making this relationship work for both of us. That's the thing with Nerissa, we want it to be symbiotic, right? We don't just want you to be giving, 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 giving. We want to try and do our share. So again, Faye, it's amazing. Uh, Brandy, any final thoughts from you? I, I think it's just, it's really important um, that teachers really know what's out there. Um, I actually just finished um, through the Geotech Center, um, the Geospatial Technology education certification pilot, whereas many of you guys are probably GISPs. Um, we're trying to develop a GISP for educators. Um, and we just finished the pilot. Um, there'll be another um, pilot that's going to happen. I think it's going to start next summer. Um, and I'm going to be on the other end of that um, with um, the teaching aspect of it um, and evaluating on that. Um, so look out for that because that will be coming around and you can tell your teacher friends that they can become GSP, GST education certified. So <laughs> that's amazing, Brandy. Honestly, we actually asked Jack that question about if, if they're going to be coming up with some sort of a Esri based teacher certification, because that's the reality, right? If you're mm -hmm. doing professional development, you want to be able to, to account that and then be able to show people you've done this. You know, it's and one we thing. Worked, we worked with Charlie um, Fitzpatrick with it um, and Joseph Kersky. Um, they, um, Joseph Kersky was a mentor for our pilot. Um, and Charlie was there when we came up with the whole development for it. Um, so it, it's, you know, Esri's backing us and we've got their support on it. And um, it will be really exciting to see where it goes. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. All right. Well, Brandy, again, thank you so much for being here. Your perspective has just been incredible. And I think that, again, that's how we need to learn. We can't be sitting up in our ivory tower saying this is what should happen. We have to get down to the grassroots and get into the muck a little bit and figure out what's not working and help, like I said, help be that bridge and help make things work. So ladies, thank you so much, Pam. Thank you. So just so everyone knows, we did put the link to the next meeting in the chat. Um, so you hear from us. The goal is to try and keep things connected. So the next two events are using the same link. That way you don't have to fumble for links. Um, so we'll leave this on for a few minutes. If you want, if anyone wants to stay and, 
and uh, watch some slides reporting. Otherwise, the next meeting uh, should be open already. So if you want to go and join that, and we'll get started with our Geo Lunch roundtable discussion of our aha moments in just a few minutes. So ladies, thank you again. It's been a pleasure, and we'll definitely be in touch soon, okay? Have a great day. We'll see you all in the next one. Thank you.